Well, hello, everybody. This is David Bianco. Welcome back to the channel. And if it's your first time here, a special thanks for taking the time. So this is the first vinyl shootout of 2024, and it's going to be Steely Dan's Gaucho. That's coming up next on the Safe and Sound Texas Audio Excursion. This is my first vinyl shootout of 2024. Earlier in the month, I have released a video which uh, goes into some clarifications about how I do my vinyl shootouts, and I called it the method to my madness. And it might be something interesting if you haven't seen that. It'll give you a little bit of a, a backstory on what I do in order to do these. But this one is one that I had planned to do originally when the release of Gaucho came out on December 1st of 2023, but it was supposed to be a simultaneous release of the Universal $30 version and the Analog Productions UHQR. Unfortunately, the UHQR has been delayed uh, until sometime uh, this quarter. Hopefully, maybe by the end of February, we'll see it. But I did want to go ahead and review the version that Universal has been putting out concurrent typically with the releases from Analog Productions. I'll get into that more specifically, but let's look at Gaucho. Gaucho is every bit as interesting an album in terms of how it came to be and what occurred during the recording of it as it is in the quality of the outcome. So a lot of drama. But the term gaucho, I wondered what that was about, and I guess it's a term that's used for a skilled horseman, kind of like a cowboy term is in the U.S. Uh, the term here goes back to 18th and 19th century and the Argentine and Uruguayan pampas or the grasslands. So uh, that term was one that was gathered from that meaning. Uh, this album ended up being the seventh Steely Dan release, uh, and it was released on November 21st, 1980 on MCA Records. Now, it took over a year to record this record, and there were over 42 studio musicians used for this recording. Uh, when you look at the listing, it's a lot of impressive names, but it, it took a lot to cobble this album together. Uh, it did enter the top 10 in the U.S., peaking at number nine. Uh, hey 19 was released as a single concurrent with the album release, but then the next singles out kind of split. The U.S. released Time Out of Mind in March of 81, and the U.K. released Babylon Sisters in March of 81. Uh, the primary engineer on this was Roger the Immortal Nichols. It was mixed by Elliot Shiner, mastered by Robert Ludwig, and of course produced by Gary Katz. Effects and sequencing were provided by what call, was called Wendell, which is a computerized drum sound machine that was invented by Roger Nichols. And this album won the best engineering recording, non-classical, at the 24th Annual Grammy Awards. Now, what's ironic about this is that because Wendell was a contributor, it also received uh, a Grammy. Now, they had to give the device a name to be able to give it the award. I talk about this a bit in my interview with Simsy Nichols, who is Roger Nichols' daughter. So I'll leave a link to that one in the description as well. Really interesting backstories on Roger Nichols. In the 24th Grammy, this was also nominated for Album of the Year and Best Pop Performance by a duo or group with vocals. You know, this album could have had a subtitle that said, anything that could go wrong did go wrong. You know, the rec in all, they recorded about a dozen songs during sessions uh, in New York, Los Angeles, and Philadelphia. Uh, and uh, Becker and Fagan uh, noted a greater reliance on doing layering tracks for this album. And... The old story there is that one of those casualties of the overdub process resulted from an assistant engineer's accidental erasure of nearly three weeks of work on a song called The Second Arrangement, an earlier contender for one of the most promising tracks. Now, ultimately, that track, The Second Arrangement, was saved by Roger Nichols to cassette, 
and it is available. If you look up Steely Dan, the second arrangement on YouTube, you'll see various versions of it that have been extrapolated out. And Simsy, his daughter, talks a lot about that uh, as well. Now, on top of what was going on for a year with all these musicians, there was some human tragedy uh, during this time also. Uh, the song Time Out of Mind was conceived as Walter Becker's own struggle with addiction. And during this time, it was compounded in January 1980 by the death of his longtime partner, Karen Stanley, from an overdose of drugs at their apartment. So human tragedy followed this album. But even then, after he was getting over that, he himself, Becker, was hit by a taxi while crossing a Manhattan street, shattering his right leg in multiple places. And uh, these legal and medical crises would sideline him from the mixing and mastering phases of Gaucho's production, which was a big deal because he was really a key person. It really handicapped the completion of the project. Because Fagan and producer Gary Katz and engineer Nichols all had keen ears, but Becker was more of the alpha audiophile whose input was always vital. And it weighed heavily on, on Fagan and Katz, uh, Fagan during the mix down and then Katz during the mastering. And then on top of that, there were legal woes. During the long march to complete this album, there was some turmoil because Steely Dan during the time had signed a new agreement with Warner Brothers Records to move forward, to which they signed when they were recording Asia. But MCA said that, uh, and they absorbed ABC Records, MCA said, no, you owe us an album. And so they wanted to deny that obligation, Steely Dan did, but they lost in court. Uh, so MCA prevailed, and that's why Gaucho is on MCA. So that's a real uh, a whole, whole basket of drama that really was occurring in the background, and one of the reasons why this album took so long to get completed. So let's get into the actual release. The album yielded seven songs, actually, three on side A, four on side B, in spite of uh, there being up to 12 songs being done during all the sessions. Of course, we had some of that uh, tape erasure happen and some of these other calamities occur. Some songs weren't chosen. That's a normal process. But the delivery of the album yielded these three songs on side A and four songs on side B. So I have my equipment list as usual with my two turntables, two Audio-Technica cartridges, a Graham Slee uh, a Special Edition 2 phono stage, a switch between them so that I can go back and forth, and then my NAD amp, my Polk Audio speakers, and my Sony MDRV6 headphones. And again, one of the things I talked about in my uh, What's the Method to My Madness is that I use both headphones and speakers to evaluate these records because it is, of course, a very different experience. Now, the pressings that I have are basically three different ones that were first press master discs with RL uh, in the dead wax for Robert Ludwig. Uh, their EDP, which is the Europa disc plating. Uh, so these are the ones you want. Now, two of them were here from the U.S., and one was actually acquired in Sweden, and it had the marking on the back that it was for export only, but uh, the actual album inside was, in fact, one of the U.S. versions uh, as well. So I've lumped them together, and we'll compare them because they are pretty much uh, together in terms of the way they sounded against the Canada Master File Series, which is a half-speed mastered series that came out of Canada. And again, the last one is the one we're comparing to for the new release in 2023, uh, the Bernie Grunman remastered, and it was remastered to high-res digital tape. And then that was provided to Alex Abrash, who did the mastering for the Universal Geffen release that came out on December 1st. So we're really trying to see how good is that new slash latest release. So we're going to start with the quietness of the vinyl, an important factor in my opinion. Of course, once the music gets going, it's not usually as audible until you get to quieter parts, but it is a factor in my opinion. 
So for the first pressing of the three different versions I had, uh, they all had a degree of noise to them. And so on average, I'm going to rate them a 7.5. Uh, they varied a bit, but they were they were all a little more noisy uh, in terms of uh, groove noise. Hearing the intro grooves and between the grooves, uh, it was a little more noisy than what I would normally see from an OG. Not awful, awful, but definitely uh, something that was distracting uh, during those transitions. Uh, whereas the master file from Canada was an 8.0, it was a it was a cleaner vinyl. It was a little bit quieter uh, and less distracting. And the good news is the new one, uh, which was, uh, you know, obviously recently cut, uh, it was rated 8.5. So we have 7.5 to 8.0 to 8.5. So in that category, increasingly better for the newer release. And that's a good thing. You would hope and expect that um, with the age of older vinyl and the fact that we should be able to do a better job with the, the resins and the equipment from today. So that was a positive start there with the new release. Now, when we get to the base uh, and looking at that between the three, the, the original pressing really had solid, accurate bass. I mean, it was very poignant and very punchy um, and very uh, precise, I would say, in its articulation through the speakers and on the headphones. Whereas the master file, uh, it lacked some of that. And again, this may be the half-speed mastering on the lower end can suffer because the top end sometimes gets a little more attention in the way it ends up sounding. So we got an 8.0 there. So quite a, a chop down there on the master file. And the newer one's an 8.5. It's a little more punchy than the master file. Not quite as much as the original press. But again, not maybe as precise either as well. Didn't seem like the actual... Um, registration of what hurts the sound was at was quite as precise. It was a little more muddled than it was on the original. Moving to the mid-range, what we find there again is very strong high marks on the first pressing. Uh, very good vocals, very present, uh, very open in that regard, and, and sounding very much like you would expect a Steely Dan record to sound. Now, the Master File series, although it was better in the mids than in the bass, it still didn't have quite that level of precision, and it was just a little bit sloppy in the middle and didn't have that. Going to the 2023, uh, that was there even there it was even a little worse in the sense that it was it was a little blurred in the middle it wasn't things weren't segregated very well at all and it was a little mushy as I would call it in that midsection some of the vocals didn't have the standout that they did on the original and so it kind of blended in a little bit too much and didn't really give me that feeling that I needed to segregate the voices and to have some distinctions there. And that was especially present on headphones because I'm going to talk about some of the fatigue that I experienced in the release that just came out recently from Universal. Then in the treble, we have a good solid treble from the first press. Uh, balanced treble with the mids and the bass. They all rank 9.5. So everything's really well balanced and has its place and has a home um, as opposed to any one thing overpowering another. Quite different on the master file where it is the treble that gets the attention here. It gets the top end and it is omnipresent. Unfortunately, with the other numbers being lower, the bass and the mids, it actually creates an aura of sensation where it's too much. So even though the rating number is the same, it doesn't sound as clean, crisp, and clear, and in, in the whole sound stage, present as it should be, it sounds exaggerated because of the lack therein of those lower ranges. So it becomes a little bit annoying on that top end on the master file. But the 2023 Universal here only gets an 8.25 there as well. And part of that reason, again, is some of that uh, concentration of sound that occurs where it doesn't have a clearer distinction. It's there, but it really isn't in a place where you can evaluate the sound of it and enjoy it in the context of everything else. 
just a little bit too much mishmashing going on in what I'm hearing. And where that really shows its ugly head is in imaging, openness, and airiness. This is where you see it. And there are so many places and so many portions of all these tracks that have an open sound to them. Like Babylon Sisters, Shake It. That end there is just open, open, open. And on the original, you just get that full opening of that. Whereas on the other two, you really don't. They seem to be lacking. They seem to stop short. They don't seem to have that openness. And because of that, that is really where uh, the newer version, the 2023, really has this really uh, boxed in kind of sound, I would call it. Now, it's got its punch and it's got its presence and it doesn't sound bad. But man, when you compare it to the other, especially the OG, you kind of realize that everything's kind of boxed up in a little uh, way of holding things together within the new release. Whereas the open, when it was the the original was open and just really was able to take the sonics of uh, the soundstage that they were working in and the equipment, the microphones, and everything about the way it was mixed and done and really air it out, so to speak. And this is really the distinction. And I think this is what causes the fatigue when I listen to this, especially on headphones. I couldn't go two songs on the newer release without me feeling fatigued when I was listening to it. Where the other two, especially the original, were more, you know, like butter. It was just flowed and it just sounded good and it just, you know, it just went and you could just sit there and listen to one side and not even think that you have any ear fatigue. Whereas this newer one was challenging to me in that regard. And so in the end, we end up with these ratings of a 9.2 for the first press. Well, again, the quietness of the vinyl slammed that one down pretty badly. Otherwise, you see those numbers would have taken an average beyond 9.5, obviously. So really, there we took a hit for that, but it ends up way on the high end of the overall rating. The master file came out at 8.4 and the new version 8.2. So again... This is the way the sound stage is here. This is the way the presentation of it is and how much there is in that original work that was done and what's present. And I fully expect that the 45 RPM UHQR release is going to have that and more if history is any indication. So that'll be a marvel to listen to. Um, the new one, yeah, I mean, if you want something that's got, you know, it's new, quiet vinyl, just you just listen to it, you know, you're not really analyzing it, or you listen to it in the other room, or it's not one of your top 10 favorite albums, whatever, okay, well, you know, it has its place. But at the same time, I have to say, you know, the OGs, you can go out there and find some for 30 bucks that are in decent shape as well. And you're definitely going to hear a more analog kind of sound. I mean, uh, you know, sometimes the newer one reminded me of how things sound a bit in Spotify and some of the streaming services. Everything just gets a little bit too muddled as opposed to having that open, airy sound. It tries to force it by maybe being a dB or two louder, uh, which, of course, is something that I, I, I allocated for. But in the end, it just seems a bit forced. And then again, when you go back to the original and you hear it being so open, you realize, yeah, that is what was intended. So I'm looking forward to getting in the UHQR in the next uh, 30 to 45 days, hopefully, Chad, and uh, comparing it to the original because that's the one to compare it to. Now we know that. I won't even mess with these other ones. We're going to focus on the original releases versus the one that's coming out on two albums at 45 RPM on Clarity Vinyl from Analog Productions. Well, I hope you enjoyed this, and if you did, please subscribe to the channel by clicking on the bell below in the All option. A thumbs up is appreciated, as always, as our comments. Love getting those and responding. So until we meet next time, thanks again for joining me here at the Safe and Sound Texas audio excursion. Take care, everybody.